I have had the blessing um, in my journey through seminary and the congregations that I have served, and even my home church, to be part of congregations that were vital and vibrant. Right? There was something happening, and there was a spirit there that uh, it felt like, right? It was, just felt like a good, lively place to be. And when I was in my last congregation, I got a phone call from a woman uh, in another congregation in the Senate, and she said, hey, I heard about you guys, and I wanted to talk to you about what you're doing, because our congregation is really struggling, and I don't know if we're doing the right things. And so we had a conversation, and we had a food pantry and feeding ministry, and they had a food pantry and feeding ministry. And as we, you know, went down all the things, they were doing all the same things we were doing, right? There is, when you think about the church, there is the what of church. What are we doing? And Jesus tells us what to do, right? We're supposed to feed hungry people and clothe naked people and visit people in prison and love your neighbor as yourself. Then there's the Great Commission, which comes at the end of Matthew, go and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them everything, to obey everything I have taught you, right? So there is certainly a what of what the church is supposed to do, called to do by Jesus. And as I talked to this woman, it sounded like they were doing, right, all of the what. So then I had a question, maybe it's the how, right? There's the what the church does, but how we do it matters. And so it's kind of hard to sort all that out over a phone call, but then she mentioned something that made me go, oh, they had an endowment. Now, if you want to get a group of pastors fired up, there's lots of questions you can ask. But just throw out the question whether or not we should have endowments, and you'll see people going back and forth, right? Some will say, yes, absolutely. It's a way for people to give uh, legacy gifts that allow you to continue to fund new and interesting things into the future. And others, where I have generally been, would say, if we have a big pile of money, then the church can start to go, well, we don't have to worry about it because it's over there. And then you end up with a church that's got a million dollars in the bank and 20 people and no real energy because, right, they just sort of relied on that thing that was always there. So today's not the day to sort out that debate, but she told me they had an endowment. And I thought, oh, well, maybe that's it, right? You're doing all the right things, but maybe that endowment is something that's holding you guys back. Maybe the how of your doing ministry uh, is getting in the way. If she called me today, I would not say any of that. I would ask, why do you do what you do? Because that's a different question, right? The church is very good at the what. Uh, because Jesus tells us the what, and uh, lots of churches have mission statements, and many of those mission statements sound a lot like the Great Commission, and almost all those mission statements have verbs in them, right? Because a good mission statement, it might say, share the love of God. It might say, go and, like all these different things. So we got the what down, and sometimes the how might be a question, but the why is the thing. So we might ask, why do we feed hungry people? Because they're hungry and they need to eat, right? That might be one reason. We also might say we feed hungry people because Jesus told us to. Or we feed hungry people because it gives us a sense of purpose, right? There's all kinds of answers to that why question. Why do you reread the Bible? To learn something new. Sometimes people say, well, I'm looking for answers in life. We might read the Bible because it brings us comfort or because it challenges us. Uh, why do we uh, worship? Again, lots of reasons, right? We worship to praise God. Sometimes you might say, well, that's what gets me through my week, right? There's different reasons that we come and worship. Uh, why do we invest in the relationships in our lives? Well, again, right? We're wired for relationship. That's where we find, right, companionship. It's terrible to be alone. There's all kinds of answers. And we could keep going. Why are we generous? Well, some people are generous because there's a tax break. Some people are generous because they feel guilty if they don't give. Some people are generous because it seems like the right thing to do, right? And all of these whys are important because they are part of why we gather and do what we do. But sometimes our why might get us to doing the what in a way that isn't the best way. Uh, sometimes if you're helping somebody and you feel good about helping them, you might not actually be helping them, right? You might be enabling them or doing something else that isn't all that helpful, uh, but you feel good about it, right? You go home at the end of the day and say, yep, I did my good deed, and the person you helped is over there going, what was that all about, right? 
So that why can matter. There's whole stretches of the church that understand that part of the church's job apparently seems to be to police the culture's behavior, right? To judge people and figure out who's doing and not doing the right things and to try to enforce their view of the world on everybody else. I haven't found that as a command in Scripture yet, but that is a why, right? There are, I, I went to a, a multi-site church conference when I was an intern uh, for congregations that had more than one campus. And there were very few people there that came from my general theological worldview. So when they said mission, what they meant was go find people who don't believe in Jesus and get them to say yes to Jesus. Now, the Great Commission does tell us to go and baptize and teach people, but why, right? Well, their why might be, well, if you don't, then they end up where? In hell, right? But that's not what Jesus says. He doesn't say go depopulate hell. He says go baptize people, right? And so if that's your uh, why, that can take you to some places. I read a, a book once that said uh, it celebrated that millennials that were uh, believed in Jesus uh, regularly would befriend people with the hopes that they could convert them to Christianity. Do you want someone to befriend you because their hope is to change your mind and get you to do something different than you're doing today? No. Now, you might hope that you're going to grow and change. You just don't want people to come at you with that's their why, right? And so what we do as a church matters. How we do it matters. But why we do it, I think, sometimes gets lost. In the passage we hear from John today, Jesus tells us why. And I think Many church mission statements could have the what and the why together, and it might help us with some clarity. Now, before I get to the why, there's some really important stuff in this text from John. Jesus starts off with this, I've glorified you, you have glorified me. He's praying to God as he's getting ready to say goodbye to the disciples. And then he says, you have given me authority over all people. Did you hear a parenthesis where there were a bunch of exceptions? No. All means? All. He then says, all that you have given me, I will give eternal life. And then he goes on a little while later, and it starts to sound like maybe it didn't really mean all. Because he said, well, the ones that you have given me have heard your word, right? Does everybody heard the word? We might go, maybe not. And then he says, I pray this on the behalf of the ones you have given me, not on behalf of the world. So it's starting to sound like Jesus is saying, you gave me authority for everybody, but there's this little group right here that's going to get the special treatment that nobody else gets. Now, if you back up in John to the 10th chapter, in where Jesus is the good shepherd, at one point Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. And you might say, well, only the sheep do not the goats and everybody else, right? But then at one point he says, I have another flock. So there's those that maybe have heard and understood and believe in Jesus, but he says, I have a whole other flock, and in the end, there's going to be one flock. Then you get to the 12th chapter of John, and Jesus says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Again, no exceptions. So if you're tracking along with John, when I get to the 17th chapter and he says, I pray it on behalf of the ones you gave me. He just said, I gave you authority, or you gave me authority over everybody. So then I hear, and all the ones you gave me, right, I pray it on their behalf, not on behalf of the world. Now, the word for world is cosmos. What is the cosmos? The whole of the creation, right? And then you can also find places where it maybe has a narrow meaning of kind of like humanity, so when Jesus says, I pray it for the ones you gave me, which he just told us was everybody, not for the cosmos, I think Jesus might be saying, you know what, humanity is a mess. There's a whole lot of stuff going on here. I'm not doing this for behalf of that. I'm doing it for the people. And you gave me all the people, and so I'm going to bring them eternal life. Now when you hear eternal life, my guess is lots of people think, oh, right, when you die then you go to heaven. Well, that's not what Jesus says eternal life is. He says, you gave me authority over all these people, and the ones you gave me, I'm going to give eternal life, and eternal life is to know you, God, as the one true God, and to know me who you sent. 
Now, that doesn't mean that doesn't last forever and that that's not something that we grow into and when we get to that resurrected life that we really fully know God, right? That's where we talk about seeing through a mirror dimly now, Paul says. But this is eternal life according to Jesus, to know God and to know Jesus who God sent. So if you take all of the doing and say, why are we doing it? Jesus tells us the answer is to know God. So you can then go back to all of those things that we do and say, why do we worship? Well, of course we worship to praise God and to gather in community and for all the reasons we do. But hopefully, we also do it so that we can know God. When you read the Bible, do you read it to learn something? Yes. Do you read it for comfort? Yes. I hope you read it and come to know God. Right? Like there's that why. And, and you go through all those things, our relationships, the reasons we serve in the world. Are we going to feel good about serving in the world? Sure. Is every way that you serve in the world going to send you home feeling happy and joyful at the end of the day? No. But I would bet that those are the places we might come to know God more deeply because Jesus meets us in the cross and meets us in suffering. So if we go out and serve in the world, the why, there's all kinds of them, but one of them is that we might come to know God more deeply and so might the people that we serve. When we're generous, when we give stuff away, whether it's our finances or whether it's our heart or our trust whatever that is why well there's all those other reasons but hopefully in doing so we come to know God more deeply now here's the hard part all of that what that we do do we work our way into knowing God this is where you all say no because we went to confirmation and in confirmation we learned that uh, we cannot by our own power come to know and love Jesus but that the Holy Spirit's the one that does that, right? So we can't work our way into knowing God. So why am I telling you that this is a why? Right? If we can't do anything about it, well, if we do the things that Jesus tells us to do and invites us to do, and if we understand that why we do it might be coming to know God, it doesn't mean we work our way to it. It just means that we get into spaces where it might happen, and this is where the rest of this passage matters. Uh, anytime you're in John... Sometimes it just sounds like a whole lot of words, too many, right? I glorify you, Father, you glorified me, you glorified me with the glory that I had before the world existed, and that, like all that. Glory and glora, to glorify uh, in this uh, passage in John kind of has the sense of um, to give or receive a share in the, in the divine. So when Jesus says, I have glorified you and you have glorified me, it means they're sharing in that divine reality. And so, well, of course they are. It's God. But Jesus says, I'm going to give them eternal life so they can know you. And before they have done anything, Jesus says, I have been glorified in them. Which means Jesus is giving and receiving a share of the divine, a share of the kingdom with all of those people that are around him just then. And it means the same thing for us. Before we get to any of the what's of what we do as a church or how we do it, Jesus has already given us and received from us in this weird relationship we have with God a share of divinity, a share in the kingdom, a share in what we might call eternal life. And whether we feel like we know God at any given point, what Jesus tells us in this story is that he already knows us. God already knows us, each and every one of us, just as we were created and is dragging us forward, kicking and screaming sometimes into the places that God created us to be. And when we get there and on the way, we might come to know God. So all of the things that we do are a response to that gift of grace, their response to God already having claimed us and known us, their response to these waters of baptism where all of that is true. And in the process... Right? That vitality and that vibrancy comes from doing the things we're called to do, but being curious about where God might be showing up, because God is already showing up. It's just a matter of whether we see it or not. Luther says about the Lord's Prayer, a good chunk of it, that we pray it not to make it happen, right? We don't pray God's kingdom into being. It's already coming. The will of God is already being done. We pray it so that we might see it. And that's how this thing works, right? God knows us, and we pray that we might too come to know God and all of the what's that we do, that why sits right there with us so that we can be curious about how God's loves work, not just for us,
but for the sake of the world that uh, can come to know that same God that we come to know along the way. Amen.